For those who don't know, I'm Ann Bocock. I welcome you to Between the Covers, presented by WXEL Television and Murder on the Beach Mystery Bookstore. My guest today is award-winning mystery author Elaine Veets. Elaine is such fun to interview. You are going to love this today, I guarantee you. I cannot wait to introduce you. And she, by the way, I said award-winning. She's won them all. The Agatha, the Anthony, Lefty Awards. I'm sure there are more that I did not get to. Elaine Veets. Thank you. <laughs> she is the author of two best-selling series. The one we're going to talk about today is the Dead End series, where her main character, Helen Hawthorne, works a different low-paying job in each book. And for background and research, Elaine herself began the series by working every one of these dead-end jobs herself. And let me tell you, they are not pretty. Her second series is set in the world of mystery shopping with the adorable heroine, Josie Marcus. Well, today, South Florida is it. The book is the Dead End Job series. The new one is called Catnapped. And please welcome Elaine Veets. Elaine, this is Lucky 13. It absolutely is. Lucky 13 in the series. And if they get better and better, you are so witty. You are right in such a clever way. Thank you, because they are sheer entertainment. Well, thank you. And this, this was a subject I enjoy. I like cats, I like writing, and I like South Florida. And I'm going to ask you to speak just a little bit louder so the, the, the back row can, can okay. hear, or, or turn to them, which would make it even better. For a little bit of background, I'm just going to, for, for those who, who may not have read this series, Helen Hawthorne and her husband Phil are now private investigators. And for their investigations, she goes undercover to work these low-wage jobs. In this case, in Catnapped, it begins with, if, if I'm correct, Elaine, a dead body, a ransom note, and a show cat that's gone missing. It starts out as a pet custody case. And my Helen Hawthorne and, uh, and Phil Sagemont are private eyes. And uh, this is a couple. They are in the middle of a divorce. They are fighting for everything down to the last pickle fork. But they have agreed on custody of their show cat. And the husband, soon to be ex-husband, is late. He has not returned the cat at 8 o'clock Sunday night. And it's such a volatile situation that Helen and Phil are sent to pick up the prize show cat. So that's where it starts. This is a, a little different. Uh, you didn't do the, the actual dead-end job on this one, but you do know cats. I do know cats, and I had the assistance of Tracy Petty. And Tracy Petty is a judge for the Cat Fanciers Association. And so she vetted, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, all of the <laughs> cat show scenes and told me what was right, what was wrong. And uh, I was amazed. I mean, I had thought that a, that a gray show cat was gray. There's no such thing as a gray pedigreed cat. They're blue. <laughs> and I could not get used to this because I have a pedigreed cat, it's gray, and I've looked at it until I am blue in the face, and it's still gray. <laughs> it's not blue. I've seen them. They're not blue. I, I'm glad, really, that you did not have to do the job because bathing a cat, to me, would be at the absolute bottom of the bucket list. No, cleaning the litter box is the bottom <laughs> of the bucket list. But bathing a show cat is... is pretty close. Show cats, particularly the long-haired varieties like uh, Persians, have been bred to such an extent that they cannot clean themselves anymore. So you have to, you have to wash them to get their fur nice and fluffy for a show. And that starts by slathering the cat in goop, the hand cleaner. And the judge told me that this is how you do it. She's raised Persians. Um, and I have to believe her. She's got both arms. So, you know... <laughs> But you cover the cat in goop, and then you rinse it, and then you use two shampoos. Uh, the judge likes mango papaya. And then after the second shampoo, you use uh, a conditioner 
And then if it's a white cat, you use a blue rinse. And then you use a special cat hair dryer, which is not as hot as a people hair dryer in, in order to... They make to, a special cat hair dryer. They have a special cat hair okay. dryer, just so you may want to get this for your cat. I, I, I'm, I'm going to run out after this. We'll get that for my cat. And speaking of my cat, I, I have always had pets. I have always had at least one cat for the last 40 years. Reading this book has opened up my eyes to the world of show cats. Uh, to me, they, they are as familiar as Martians. Th this was a totally different world. You had cats. I have cats, and uh, m most of my cats have been rescue cats. Uh, my current cat and riding partner is Harry, and uh, Harry is your basic striped tabby, and uh, he helps me every morning by herding me into the office. And then once he's herded me into my office, he goes to sleep. He's exhausted. Uh, <laughs> But he's done his job. I'm at the computer, and that's okay. Our other cat was bred to be a show cat, and uh, her official name is Column Blue's Unsolved Mystery. And uh, she, was, she comes from a long line of show cats. Her brother won Greatest Cat in the Universe. He's got a slew of ribbons. She went to her first cat show and bit a judge, <laughs> <laughs> which meant that she was out. Uh, now, she could be shown again, but once a cat, you know, bites a judge, we're, the, the clerk at the cat show has to tell everyone that there's a biter present. And the judge told me that also the owners, having spent all of this time, you know, washing their cats, really don't want judge blood dripping all over their coat. <laughs> we have a picture uh, of the cat. All right. This is mystery. Is that beautiful? You can see she's... Gray. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know they said she's blue, but that's gray to me. And she's got, you'll notice the copper eyes. That's the hallmark of the chartreux. And they also have round bodies and short legs. And they're French cats, and they're known as potatoes on toothpicks, is what they're <laughs> called. But I don't say that to her face. It's gorgeous. The, the cat is gorgeous. In the book, in Catnapped, the cat that has been kidnapped is Justine. And Justine is a chartreux. Now what I learned, and, and obviously this is true, is that they're named according to the year. They, they, every letter of the alphabet corresponds to a different year. Every registered chartreux, every pedigreed chartreux that is born in a particular year has to have a name that starts with that letter. And Mystery was born in a U year. So her official name is Column Blue, which is the name of the cattery, Column Blue's Unsolved Mystery. And to make it fancy, they spell mystery I-E. Uh, <laughs> but when, when we got her, I felt any cat with the name Mystery in it had to be my cat. And so we just call her Mystery for short. And the name you call a cat around the house is known as their call name. So her call name is Mystery. What did you learn about the world of, I was going to call them designer cats, but they're not, they're, they're pedigreed cats. What, what did you learn about that world? The people who are involved in the cat fancy love those cats and they really want to better the breed. And they're very different in many ways from the dog show people because dog shows a, a pedigree dog, if you're going to show it, it cannot be altered. But a pedigreed cat, after it has, uh, you know, you've bred it enough for two to three kittens, uh, litters, you can then show it. And it will be raised to an altered cat is known as the premier class. I kind of like that. Okay. And, <laughs> but it's, it's really for the good of the breed. You don't have excess kittens. Uh, you, you breed it enough that, that, that you have them, and then you can still show them. And I thought that that was really good. These people are volunteers. They go to these shows out of love. You don't make money with a pedigreed cat. You may make money on the stud fees if they're winners uh, and on the breeding fees, but, but basically people do this because they love the breed, they love the breed characteristics, and they love those cats. In this book, in Catnapped, Helen Hawthorne and her husband Phil are on the case. 
Helen is working undercover, as we said. Now, for readers new to the Dead End Job series, they were not always married. This has happened fairly recently. I have to applaud you as, as an author for using the M word because usually they don't have a married equal partnership. No, and I, it's, it's hard to write dialogue for, for couples. I mean, Sue Grafton said that she is never going to marry off Kinsey Milhone because she doesn't want to do the Nick and Nora Charles dialogue. Mm -hmm. But I've been married 43 years. I'm happily married. I do believe it's possible for two equals to marry one another and, uh, and, and not score off each other all the time. So I wanted to have a series in which a happily married pair of private eyes are, uh, are, are, are the stars. And so that's, that's what Helen and Phil are. They're, they're both equals. Uh, sometimes she does stupid things, sometimes he does stupid things. But I'm really tired of TV where the man is always the buffoon. It, it just, it, it's True. tiresome. It is tiresome. I, thank you for that. I, that's, it's refreshing. So Elaine, thank you. You have the talent for getting the real point across, and you don't have to grab me by the collar and shake me to explain to me about the low-wage jobs and how difficult they are. But yes, that, that, the point is right there. And I see the social commentary. Is that intentional? It is intentional because for the first 10 of these books, I work these jobs, and they were hard. I, I was a hotel maid in Murder with Reservations, and I made 38 beds a day, uh, cleaned 17 bathrooms. Uh, the pay was minimum wage, and there were no benefits. Uh, the women that I worked with were enormously cheerful. They were much better than I would have been in these circumstances. And the job was so hard. At the end of the day, my first day, I went to bed with a bottle of Motrin. I mean, my back was killing me. I replaced a woman who had torn a rotator cuff from taking those big heavy spreads and throwing them up in the air. And that's hard work. And I, they didn't, my biggest tip was $2.38 and a can of peach nectar. <sighs> and so I asked one of the maids, I said, how much would you like to be tipped? And she said, if everyone would tip me a dollar a day, I could stay off welfare and my daughter would be proud of me. And I had thought when I was staying in an expensive hotel that the maids were making a lot of money. No, no, there's, they make as barely minimum wage whether you're paying $300 or $75 a night for a hotel room. You know, when the economy tanked in 2007, 2008, we lost millions and millions of jobs, and many of the jobs that have come back are these low-wage jobs. And many of the people that are working them are older, and not necessarily that may not have been the job that, that they lost before. And a lot of us don't apparently give a second thought when you run across people in this, these job so thank you for helping us to see them with new eyes. Well the one job that I hated the most was telemarketer. Mm, okay. And that was that was for dying to call you. And, and I, we hate that on the other end. Yes. I know everybody hates telemarketers. I hate them too. But having worked those jobs, nobody says I want to be a telemarketer when I grow up, you know? And what was ironic was I, I worked in a boiler room uh, that sold septic tank cleaner. And uh, it, was, it was down in Hollywood, and it was in a bank building. And one of the men who worked in that boiler room used to be a bank vice president in that same building. And he was back coming to that same building selling septic tank cleaner. Talk about a reversal of fortunes. It was horrible. And people were rude. Um, and, you know, I, I know you don't want to deal with a telemarketer, but just say, take me off this list. We will, we'll be fine major money if we don't. So please, please, you know, don't be rude. Just say, take me off the list. You've done it again. You opened up my eyes to the telemarketer from, from that point. So uh, again, I thank you. It's, you know, South Florida has gotten 
deservedly or not, a bad rap for being rude. And you see it every day. You see it at the grocery store. You see it at the dog groomer. You see it where, wherever you, you have worked. So I, I guess if we take a step back and realize these people are working, that's their job. Well, and it used to be, uh, for Murder Between the Covers, I, I worked at a bookstore. I worked at a Barnes and Noble. And, you know, the customer was always right. And the problem with that was that the customer was having a bad day. And so the customer would come in and do what I used to call clerk abuse. They'd had a oh. fight with their spy, spouse. Sure. They had a fight with their boss. And they were going to get you. And no matter what. And so I think the worst one was when a man came in and he had a paperback that was $6.99 and he wanted to exchange it for another $6.99 and he said, here, I'm making the exchange, I'm out of here. And I said, no, sir, I have to get the manager's approval. And he said, you're an idiot. And I said, yes, sir, but I've got to get the manager's <laughs> approval. And I'm going, manager to the front. And there's no manager. And he says, you are the biggest fool I've ever seen. And I said, yes, sir manager to the front <laughs> and this keeps going on and he keeps insulting me until finally the woman behind him goes I hate it when people don't take their medication <laughs> <laughs> and the woman behind her goes rude people stink and this went on it was a line of like six women and they all said how much they hated rudeness so when the manager finally came to the front um, and exchanged, he sort of slunk off. And the woman in the front of the line patted me on the hand and she said, you hang in there, honey, oh. you're doing a good job. <laughs> so I put him in the book, but I put in all the nice ladies too. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. I love that you also worked in the bridal salon business, which to me would be about on par when you're dealing with brides and brides and the mother of the bride with the uh, cat grooming. That has to be difficult. I don't know what happens when intelligent women get an engagement ring on the finger, <laughs> but something disconnects in the brain and the fate of the nation depends on their wedding. And, I, we, and that dress. That <laughs> dress, the dress and the bridesmaid's dress. And I was working at Zola Keller's at the time, you all know Zola, and uh, if we had Zola in, as a diplomat, we would have peace in the Middle East because we had a bride come in and she had a little baggie with some fibers in it, little green fibers, and they were celery colored. And except when you're spending $3,000 for a bridesmaid dress, you call it celadine. So in the brides, it, she says, I want to see my bridesmaid dress. So I bring it out and it's a gorgeous thing. It looks like sea foam and she holds the fibers up against it and she goes, it's two shades off, my wedding's ruined. <laughs> and I said, two shades off of what? And she says, the hotel carpet. So oh. I thought, okay, this is over my head, so I get Zola. And Zola, I tell her what's going on, Zola comes out and she says, what's the matter, honey? And the bride goes, the dress doesn't match the hotel carpet. And Zola goes, match? That is so Kmart. <laughs> Have, she said, haven't you seen Vogue? It has to be at least two shades off. <laughs> and the bride goes, it's exactly two shades. You've saved my wedding. Oh, Zola. <gasps> really, the woman is genius. I agree. Oh my goodness, that, that, what, that's brilliant. What was the worst job you worked? A uh, telemarketer was up there for the abuse. But what people don't know, and this is why you don't want to tick off a telemarketer, there's a button call that says call back. <gasps> and so if <laughs> you are really rude, we hit that button and you get a call from us every hour on the hour until you're polite. Okay, now we know. Do you enter these jobs or did you enter these jobs with a certain mindset of, okay, this is how I think this is going to be and are you usually surprised? I am often surprised. Um, I went to work for a country club, I won't give you the name, 
but I solve the problems of people who don't have problems. <laughs> and the motto of the country club was, do you know who I am? <laughs> and yes, I know who you are. You're a really rude, rich person. But, but they would come in, and I think my favorite was a doctor. And this was not a great healer. He did boob jobs. <laughs> and he comes through the door and he says, I want to speak to the redhead with the big tits. And I said, excuse me? And he says, you know, I said, do you mean the manager? And he said, yeah, that's what I said. So the manager, I said, she's out. So I get the assistant manager and she says, don't leave me alone. And, and he didn't see me anyway. I mean, I was invisible. So I stood in the corner and he says, my wife can't see the bill. And she said, well, I'm sorry, sir. It's already been mailed out. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I took my assistant here to help her perform better at what he didn't say. <laughs> and he said, and she spent $3,000. And my wife wouldn't understand. And I thought, oh, yes, yeah, she would. <laughs> and he says, he says and, and she can't see the bill. And the assistant manager said, sir, I'm really sorry, but under Florida law, country club memberships are, are, are half, you know, she's joint owner. And he said, I make the money. He said, it doesn't make any difference. She has the right to see the bill. And he said, well, then what am I going to do? And she said, why don't you make friends with your letter carrier? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the country club life. Yes. <laughs> Did you ever find you were good at these jobs? I really am bad. I mean, <laughs> I, at, at the bookstore, I kept jamming the cash register. And one of them, there was a, a, a two witches, and they were buying a book of spells. Now, oh, really. They, they were two witches. Okay. Right. If, and they're, they're wearing the pentagrams. If you were a witch, would you buy a book of spells at a Barnes and Noble? <laughs> I mean, really. What would are you, you going need to do? a book of spells? Are you going, what to do, enchant the door wreath? I mean, what are you going to do? But there they are. They've got the book of spells, and I've jammed the cash register. And so I'm trying to unjam it, and I say to David, the guy next to me, I've jammed the cash register. And he goes, here's what you do. So I punch the buttons, and it's still jammed. And I said, if they turn me into a frog, <laughs> this is all your fault. And he goes, oh, it's okay. I know somebody at Walden Books, and she undoes spells. <laughs> to ask if this is something you invented for this book or if it's true and it is C smart water CSI which they used to mark the bills that were used in, in the ransom D did you invent that no smart water CSI is being tested right here in South Florida it's a forensic coding device and it's it's a chemical signature and you get a little bottle that looks like nail polish and you put it on your watch, you can put it on your car, uh, you can put it on all sorts of things. And under a certain level of UV life, light, it will fluoresce. And that's how they know that it's your property. And the police are testing it in Fort Lauderdale, where they set up a special smart water car. And a guy broke into it, and he got a smart water shower. <laughs> and even though he took a bath, they still, it would fluoresce. If you put it on the money, which they did for the kidnapping and catnap, even if you burn that money, the ashes will fluoresce. So Smart Water CSI, you can buy it for about $200 online. And if your stuff is stolen, they will even provide an expert to show up and testify in court. It's very big in the UK, and it's now being tested in the United States here in Florida. And this is the first time it was ever in a book. Absolutely. Terrific. So did, did you saw it yourself? You saw what it looked like? I have it. Oh, you have it? Yes. Okay. I've marked everything, except the cat. Except the cat. <laughs> <All right>. Okay. <laughs> the, cat, the cat that came from the cat show probably has a microchip anyway. No. Really? She's not allowed out. Okay. okay. <laughs> She's an inside, special, pedigreed cat. All my cats are inside. Actually, they should be. They last, what I understand. Yeah, they live longer. You started as a newspaper reporter. Right. In St. Louis, correct? Correct. How did you go from writing the news of the day to making stuff up? 
If you write the news of the day, there's a very fine line. <laughs> <laughs> they, they frown on you making They frown it up, on yeah. you making it up. <laughs> Actually, I was a columnist for many years, and I, I, I wrote humor columns, and I did that for about 27 years. And then uh, I was fired, and uh, I was very happy to be fired. It was, uh, at the time I wasn't, but it turned out to be a good career move. And so I did a series in which uh, it was a real creative stretch. There was a six foot tall newspaper reporter and uh, a lot of editors died. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't resemble any editors living or dead. Okay. And that series lasted about four years and then I started the Dead End Job series. And from there I've written 22 books. Can you imagine? 22 books, which is why you have a little cheat sheet here of the, the names of all of them so that, because you've forgotten. Yes. <laughs> I understand you're also teaching a class this summer on writing the great Florida novel? I am because, uh, actually, the reason I, one of the reasons that I started the Dead End Job series is that Joanne Sinchuk with Murder on the Beach said, you need to write a Florida series from a woman's point of view. And I thought, you know, I love Carl Hyacin and I love the men who write Florida novels, but there is no stripper with a heart of gold. You know, she's after your wallet, buddy. <laughs> she doesn't think you're handsome, you know. And if a 22-year-old woman is interested in a 64-year-old man, it's not his fine mind. It's his fat wallet. And I felt this point of view needed to be seen. You write with such a sense of place because if you've read any of her Dead End Job series books, they're real places in Florida that, that we, we know. It's important to know the place where you're writing. It is, and this place is so fun. Uh, one of my favorite bars is on Oakland Park and uh, A1A. It's called the Dive Bar, and the Dive Bar has a mural out in front, but what you don't see until you look really close in the waves is there's a naked lady. <laughs> now, it's not an out there naked lady, but it's just one of the fun things to know. And Caps Island Restaurant, the place that actually sends a boat so you can go to this restaurant, which has been around since the Rum Runner days. Uh, these are things about Florida that people need to know. They're fun. The class sounds wonderful, so th thank you for teaching that. I've had such a good time today. I hope we all have. Thank you, Elaine, for being here. Thank you for Catnapped. It is a divine, fun read. It's the latest in the Helen Hawthorne Dead End Job series. Elaine, as I said, has a second series set in her hometown of St. Louis, which is Josie Marcus Mystery Shoppers series. Elaine Vietz, it has been a pleasure today. You have been watching between the Covers, presented by WXEL Television and Murder on the Beach Mystery Bookstore. I'm Ann Bocock. Thank you so much for watching today. Thank you. <laughs>